The dark land of the jungle is the country of the unknown, of savagery, terror, and peril beyond the imagination of men. Here, in the forbidden tangle of the jungle, a child was found and raised by the great apes. The boy took the name Tarzan and later was educated in civilization. But then Tarzan returned to the deadly land he knew so well. The cheetah has grown to know one who is swifter. The lion knows one who is braver, Tarzan. Deep in the jungle, Tarzan continues to enforce his law, the law of right. Tarzan's awesome warning cry is known to every living creature in the jungle. Tarzan of the Apes. I started writing the book probably a couple of years ago. It was really the beginning. The stage was just essays I was writing about class and then uh, as time went on people said you should write a book suggesting it, you know. I went for a meeting with a publisher in Glasgow. They seemed like they were up for it. It was a pal of mine who's a writer who kind of put me on it off the back of one of these essays. They seemed like they were up for it. They told me to write a chapter plan. I went up again, but I kept noticing when I went up, like, that somebody would always, like, rush out from the office to meet me before I actually entered it. It was the weirdest thing. It was like they didn't want me to come into the office. You know, they'd always take me to another room and leave me there like a wee dog tied up outside the bookies. Um, and then somebody would come and talk to me in there, you know? So... Oh, uh, in the bookies? Nah, in this wee side room, you know? So I would go up, actually, funnily enough, I, I, I was sitting in the side room at this publisher and, uh, and because I was bored, I wrote on a flip chart paper, it was like a meeting room, I wrote a flip chart to do list. Uh, commission Loki's book, Poverty Safari. Thinking it would be a laugh, do you know what I mean? And I would think they'd, I, I would have thought they would have thought I was keen and I was up for having a laugh and they would have got on with it and just started the process of me doing the book. Mm -hmm. But after that, I left that day, I never heard from them again. Never, don't know why. I have managed to condense what I feel is the current past, present and future Scottish cultural canon down into one song. My attempt to sum up what it all sounds and feels like It's called running down the glen. Running down the glen, running down the glen, running down the glen, running down the glen. Running down the glen, running down the glen, running down the glen, running down the glen. That's pretty much it. <laughs> I would like to think that my routine would be to get up early in the morning like James Kelman and start writing at 5 o'clock and get a few hours in and have my breakfast and then have done all my writing early. But actually, we had just had a baby and we were in the process of moving house. So really I was writing any time that I could get. So having three hours sleep four hours sleep up during the night with the baby, bringing the baby in to get fed, getting up, going to one of three or four or five jobs that I'm working, right? So I'm working part-time for the council as a youth worker. I'm working at uh, freelance in a number of different locations in Bathgate, from Aberdeen to Bathgate to Edinburgh, back to Glasgow. I'm also, I've got a column that I write weekly and other freelance work in that capacity, so I've got multiple deadlines. With all of that, there's a different person you're dealing with for each of these things as well. 
plus I'm a musician and a performing artist. So when you when you put all that in the mix, you're dealing with sometimes five, ten different people every day with different arrangements, different diaries. That just to even get in the headspace to think about writing is really hard. But when you realise there's no other choice, then before you know it, you find yourself waking him up in the back of taxis with a laptop open, trying to get a few hundred words down. You're on a bus, you're recording stuff on a dictaphone or onto a phone app or whatever. Uh, you're, you're writing on the train, you're, uh, any chance that you can get really. You're drinking lots of coffee, eating lots of sweets. Lifestyle goes out the window and really like it's just a case of uh, like it's a case of just getting a few hundred words done whenever you can. I would never, ever, ever go through the experience that I went through writing this book ever again. I wouldn't survive it. My family wouldn't survive it. Like honestly, if it wasn't for the support that we got from our family, looking after the baby, looking after us, uh, as well as you know other writers and other artists that I've formed relationships with who could support in different ways then it wouldn't have been possible, like, it's just, I'd end up having to quit all my jobs, do you know what I mean, in order to finish it. So it was either, don't finish the book and don't pursue the opportunity. Basically, throw out all the security that you've got, all the financial security that you've got, based on a gamble that if you can write a good book, you might be able to just do that and that could be your job. And that was the big battle, do you know what I mean? Because you've got a family and all that, it can be a bit indulgent to take that sort of risk. Luckily they were all on board, you know, and they believe that I can do it, so I guess I've got to believe I can do it as well. I grew up in Pollock, south side of Glasgow. I mean, like, it's just the sort of classic Scottish housing scheme, really. Um, when I was growing up, we didn't have double glazing windies, we didn't have central heating. Uh, and that that environment, whether you like it or not, it's it's so extreme that it it really sort of it just chisels you. If this was a book that I had had to write as opposed to a book that I wanted to write, it wouldn't have been possible. I want to sit here and say, what an amazing experience, and I've been homeless, and I've been through alcoholism, so I know what it's like to live in the shit, and I'll tell you, this this was a breeze compared to that, it wasn't it? really wasn't it? Especially if you don't drink anymore, you've nowhere to turn, you've no, you can't numb it all off, it's always there, so you're learning to deal with it. But see, because, see, because, the, the passion I have for this topic, the passion that I have for, and the belief I have that we need, we need more people who come from the sort of background that people like me come from, to show the richness of working class life. There's a richness to it, there's a moral logic to it, that's not accounted for in mainstream culture. It's powerful, it's provocative, and it's entirely necessary at this point in time. But I'm sure you'll agree he deserves one more big round of applause. Put your hands together for Darren McGarvey! So, it's... The book tries to sort of... The book tries to not just talk about, oh, this is like in a scheme. It's nice to say this is what it's like. This is why I, this is why we can't ascend. These are the things that hold us back from taking our rightful place in culture and showing the interiority of our working class existence is beyond more than just aggression and apathy and self-defeating def addictions and all of these things that are often associated with us and some of them are fair associations I would say. But there's a whole other, there's a whole community dynamic in working class life that's as far as I can see, doesn't doesn't exist to the same extent uh, in middle class communities, and, and you know I try to talk, cover all that in the book. These aren't cultures 
at different stages of maturity, which is often assumed, the working class culture being further back on the continuum, ascending and aspiring to become middle class. These are parallel cultures that need to learn from each other, that exist parallel to each other, separated by a ravine of experience. And only by us crossing the ravine and really listening to each other will we be able to fill in the gaps in both of our knowledge that's holding us all back. And and that's that's where I'm at with it, you know. The book's not a weapon. The book's not a brick that you have to go and lob at the next vegan that you see in Byers Road. You know, the book is as critical of me and the way that I see things uh, as it is of society, of capitalism, of politicians. And I'm hoping that that spirit of self-reflection and self-criticism will be sufficient for the reader to lower their own guard and maybe start asking the question, uh, you know, where was I wrong in this? What could I do that would make things easier for conversations that are difficult as opposed to always projecting outwards and expecting reality to conform to your own expectations. But I know that's not everybody's cup of tea.